Sunday Showcase, highlighting some of the best audio storytelling found anywhere. All right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Welcome back to Mutual Presents. I'm Jack Ward, right here with my co-pilot on our voyage to the past of our forefather, the Mutual Broadcasting System, Penny, my kitty. For episode 15, we go back to Mutual Radio Theatre just one week after we released our own theatrical experience of Mutual Stage and Pete Lutz's adaptation of Charade. This week we have two features with The Mask and For the Love of Laura. Time to wind our clocks back and begin this week's look back. This is Vincent Price. Our story is about a mask, a facial covering that has known many uses, been the facade for many feelings. All of the peoples of the earth use masks in one way or another. This is the story of an African mask named Oshango Batala. Oshango Batala was an old mask carved by a mischievous master carver in the last century and had been present at many ceremonies, both frivolous and serious, as his mood suited him. Because he had been found over the years to be an untrustworthy mask capable of placing inappropriate expressions on the face of the person responsible for him, the people of his village placed him on the back wall of their mask house, between two well-behaved masks, hoping that they could talk some sense into his wooden face. Neither the people of the village nor the two masks flanking Oshango Batala had any notion that their village would ever become famous, renowned for the excellence of its carvings. But perhaps Oshango Batala knew, he with his tricky ways and love of fire. I've seen stuff from every hut in the village except that one. There is nothing of value there, sir. Why not let me decide, hmm? I mean, after all, I'm the guy making this village rich, right? With my urge to collect, my export-import business... There is really nothing there, Mr. Palmer, I assure you, except for a few old masks, uh, badly carved. Old masks? How old? Uh, very badly carved, but, Mr. Palmer. But very old. Uh, well, uh, you know, masks from the past. I'd like to see them. Oh, it is not permitted. I'll give you 50 shares to let me take a look. Oh, the people would not like it. They 100. Would... And that's my final offer. Well, it would have to be done after the people have found sleep for the night. Uh, Mr. Bob. Yeah? I must warn you. One or two of these... Are not nice masks. What's nice? I felt I should warn you. Okay. I've been warned. Too bad sometimes that we can't see beneath the surface, go behind the beyond, understand the personalities of those faces we call masks. And that's how we begin our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Mask, by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Jim Mapp and David Downing. Ralph Palmer, entrepreneur, veteran of a thousand business deals, finds himself in search of another bargain in a remote corner of Africa. It will be interesting to see what the ultimate profit will be. Mr. Palmer, uh, over here, over here. Shoot. 
talk about dark nights. Please be quiet. The people would be very disturbed about this if they found out. Uh, do you have the 100 shetties? Do you have a flashlight? Yes, I have a torch. But we must wait until we are inside the mask house. Do you have the money? Do you know something, Bruno? I kind of get the impression that you like money. I like the options that it offers. After all, I am only a poor, corrupt village official trying to feed a large family. Yeah, seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Here, you want to count it? Oh, I trust you. Now, come, follow me closely. We will have to circle behind the village. Here, push gently. We must close it to keep the light from being seen. Right. Phew. It's awfully close in here. No one has been in here for five years or more, at least. Smells like it. Let's have some light. Over here. Shine your light over here. Oh, good Lord. These are incredible. Incredible. I thought you said they were badly carved. Perhaps not so badly carved, but they represent... Here, here, shine your light over here. On that one. Yes, that one. It's magnificent. Uh, that is the trickster mask called Oshango Bartala. I want it. I have to have it. Why are those two masks on each side facing it? They are talking to him, asking him to behave. Mad guy, huh? I love it. Have to have it. Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must leave. We cannot stay. Someone might discover us. Bruno, I want that mask. Now, who would I have to see to make a deal? Uh, that one is not for sale. There is no one who you can see to buy that one, especially that one. You don't understand me too well. I want that mask. And I'm willing to pay for it. Now, who should I talk to? Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must go. I'm not leaving here without you. Uh, but you don't understand. This I'll give you 200 shedders to help me get it out of here. And I'm not going to bargain with you now. That's my first and final offer. I, I don't want Look, to. Look, let's, let's be sensible. Now, you need money to feed your large family. I need this mask for my collection. How long did you say it had been here? For five years or so. I... All right, five years. It's a sense that it might not be missed for another five years or so. By that time, no one will know what happened to it. The mask will know. Okay, okay, the mask will know. Big deal. It'll be hanging on the wall in my den. Good light, pleasant surroundings, and... Uh, did you say 300, Sherry? No, I said 250. Now, give me a hand. Help me take it down. Uh, do you have the money now? Of course not. I'll give it to you when you get back to the hotel. Hold that light steady. Ooh, this thing is really heavy. Someone comes. Ay, oh, that was close. What happened? We were caught coming out of here with this. In the old days, we would be killed. Oh, oh, uh, well, it's a good thing it isn't the old days. Oh, come on, give me a hand. Paging Mr. Palmer. Paging Mr. Ralph Palmer. Please come to the message desk, please. I'm Palmer. Do you have a message for me? Yes. Here you are, sir. My husband, Brunkine Guy, asked that I send you this before your departure. My husband is in hospital. Suffering from burns on his chest and arms. The doctors have assured us that his injuries are not permanent. The accident was caused by an exploding oil stove. He thanks you for allowing him the privilege of being your guide during the time you were in our village. He also asks you to be careful of the mask. Sincerely yours, Mrs. Mary Ingai. The story of 
Shango Batala, the mask continues. Ralph, I'm telling you for the third time, that thing winked at me, and I want it out of this house. Oh, come on, Eva. Now be sensible. How could a wooden mask wink at you? That's a good question, Mom. How could a wooden mask wink at you? Yeah, Mom, how could a wooden mask wink at you? Okay, okay, you guys. Maybe it didn't wink at me, but it did something else. I was lighting a cigarette yesterday in the den, and the light flamed up suddenly, and the eyes in that thing seemed to light up, too, as though it were happy to see the flame. In addition, I almost had my eyelashes singed off. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe it's the kind of wooden mask that gets excited when it sees oh, fire. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you ought to wear shorter eyelashes, Mom. You know what I can't understand, Dad? Why is it with all the beautiful African lady statuettes, you'd have to come away with the face of a dirty old man with brass tacks around his mouth? Now who's talking nonsense? Eric, uh, I'd have to give you a question. Very careful consideration. But seriously, Ivan, uh, what's really the uh, the problem with you, huh? And this particular piece. I mean, after all, we, we have at least 20 or 30 other masks around the house. Oh, what's so disturbing about this mm, one? I, I don't know. It's, it's grotesque. That's what it is. It's grotesque. Look, Max is dropping in this evening, remember? The last thing I'd like to have is a major league collector come into a family that's panning the products. Major league collector, minor league collector, or whatever. You've got to do something with that thing. Now, why don't we get back to this tomorrow, hmm? Put it on hold, okay? Whenever. But let's have it clearly understood. I want it out. Hark! If I'm not mistaken, our major league collector is here. Open it, will you, Adrian? Max seems to pop in on a better mood when you open the door for him. It's Mr. Falcon. Hi, go right on in. Oh, my, 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 Adrian, you certainly changed. <laughs> Since last month. Well, Ralph, old stick, welcome back. Yvonne, I must say you're becoming more and more... Oh, <laughs> come now, Max, you always say that. <laughs> Can I fix you a drink? <laughs> yes, yeah, gin and tonic. Well, Eric, how's, uh, how's the ball treating you? So far, so good. I'll know when the season starts. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I've uh, somehow formed the conclusion that American football is like the weather. It's always there, but no one can do anything about it. Hmm? Ah, thank you, Yvonne. Well, Ralph, uh, I can tell from that devastatingly perkish smile that you've got a surprise or two for the old falcon there. Eh? Well, maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't. Well, why don't we take a peek? Bring your drink. I placed the new pieces here in the den. Daddy, why don't you deal in materials more? I mean, you have a point there, Adrian. African fashions are... Well, I must say, Ralph, quite an extraordinary gathering, quite. And this superb piece here, with its somewhat malevolent expression, now that is a real find. One could say that it was simply ugly. Oh, oh. If one had to say something like that... Now, please, please, old stick, don't try to cancel out real emotions. That's one of the beauties of the African mask. Some people simply cannot get past that enigmatic facade. I smell smoke. Hmm? Smoke? Hey, now, just a minute. I know some people don't like long dresses, but this is... I'm, I'm sorry, Mom, but the hem of your dress was smoking. What? See? Hmm. I guess I'll have to give up smoking or start wearing shorter dresses. Ivana, are you okay? Mm, tail feathers singed, but okay, I think. My word, what on earth happened? I mean, how could the train of your dress cut... How do things like this happen? By accident, right? Right. No other explanation. Sheer accident. can't figure it out. Life just seems to be one accident after another these days. Yvonne burning a dress last week. Adrian burning her hands on a skillet panel that she wasn't even over a flame. And now Eric's feet are catching fire. This keeps up with me needing my own personal burn unit. Mr. Palmer? Mr. Palmer? Oh, 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 who is it? Where are you? Look up here, Mr. Palmer. Me, the mask. Hey, no, no, don't give me that. Okay, Eric, that's enough now. Knock it off. 
I got a lot on my mind. I don't need this kind of distraction. This is not your son, Eric. This is Oshango Batala, the mask. I must be losing my mind. Mask don't talk. You're right. Not usually. But that's been one of my bad habits ever since I was car. Wait. Before you say another word, let me stiffen my drink. I need it. There is no need to be afraid. I come in peace. Okay. Great. I'm talking to a mask on my den wall, and it's telling me you... You're telling me that you come in peace. I don't understand. Now, what could you do to me? I could make life very hot for you. For the people around you. You you could make life hot for me? For the people around me? Yes. I won't explain how. But I thought you should know that. I think I'm already aware. In that case, I won't have to spend a lot of time beating around the tree. I want to go home. Oh, come on. Now, be sensible. You've got a beautiful room with a view yet. Everybody admires... No, they do not like me. They hate me, and they think I'm ugly, and I want to go home. Now, just a minute. Can't we put our heads together and reason this out? I don't really think so. Do what I say, or suffer the consequences. <laughs> Someone once said that we, all of us, are the faces that we show to the world. Is there a possibility that remark might also apply to masks? Eric, come in here and close the door. Adrian, pour me a stiff one, will you, honey? What's wrong, Mom? You're really wired up. There's something I have to tell you both. It's the kind of thing that would upset anybody. It's about your father. Here you go. Is he... Is he... Is he what, Eric? Well, I don't know. I just thought that maybe he Eric, was... please. Can't you see you're distracting her? Yes, you are distracting me, and I'm already distracted enough. Well, calm down, Mom. Take it easy and tell us. What about Daddy? Well, I, I hardly know where to begin. Uh, freshen this up for me, will you, dear? Hmm. Thank you, Adrian. Oh, incidentally, how are your hands? Oh, they're okay. Doctor tells me that there's no problem. Purely superficial. The skin will renew itself in a few weeks. Oh, uh, 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 could we sort of get to the reason for us being here? I have to go check on my VW. The upholstery looks like some Boy Scouts forgot to douse the fire. Okay, take a deep breath and listen closely. I don't know if I can repeat myself. Last evening, I passed the den and your father was talking to that mask. What? He was doing what? He was talking to that awful mask that he brought back from Africa. Oh, well, what were they talking about? Don't make light of this. It's the truth. I actually heard him speaking to it. What was he saying? What was he saying? Well, it seemed... It sounded as though he were trying to work out a deal. With a mask about something. You know, in a way, I uh, only had myself to blame for being caught in a situation like this. The mask house elders have been warning me for years that I would be exiled if I didn't behave myself. What caused you to misbehave in the first place? Who can say, really? I've heard several theories... One of them is that the man who carved me blasphemed before I was done. Someone also said that the wood from which I was made had not been properly blessed. And there was another point of view which said that I was made from the wrong wood. How do I know? All I know is this. I want to go home. Well, haven't you heard? You can never go home again. What? I don't understand. What are you talking about? Nothing. Look, forget about going back. Now, just a minute. I think it's terribly unfair of you to be so stubborn about this. Not being stubborn. 
I just simply fail to see any advantage to your return. But you don't understand. I'll be back where I belong. That's advantage enough. You call being locked up in a dark hut an advantage? Yes. I'm surrounded by others who have my best interests at heart. Not like here, where people stare at me as though I were a freak. Oh, come on now. That would be the case almost anywhere. Let's face it. You are strange looking. I am not. I look exactly like the way I'm supposed to look. The people who are looking at me, talking about how weird I look, are the ones who look weird. You've got a point there. But look, why let these things bother you? You're the main attraction here. I don't want to be the main attraction for a bunch of idiots who think I'm ugly. I think you're too sensitive. Who thinks you're ugly? Your wife does. She thinks I'm ugly. She comes in here from time to time, stands in front of me and thinks, how ugly. Well, how do you know she thinks that? I can read her mind. You can read her mind? You can read minds? Well, not everybody's mind, but... What kind of mind do you read? Oh, I'd say the ones that have definite ideas, notions. Like, uh, let's say you had someone standing in front of you, thinking in a very definite way about a matter that dealt with money. Could you read that? No. No, I'm not going to do it. I won't be a part of anything like that, no. You want to go back home, don't you? Yes, of course. I told you that. I do miss my wives. Your wives? Yes. You didn't meet them. They were sleeping in another section of our hut when you stole me. Oh... Do you realize I've aged ten years at least since you've been here? Look at this wrinkle in my forehead. If you really wanted to return, you would listen to my proposition. That's about the gist of it. Your father is blackmailing that mask. Wow. You lost me, Mom. Yeah, that's a little heavy for me, too. Mind slipping it back through? Simple. He's blackmailed the mask into working for him. The deal seems to involve the mask doing a bit of mind reading before he can... The mask reads minds? As I understand it, it can read some minds. It has obviously read minds. Whoa, let me get the straight of this. Dad has a mask hanging in his den that reads minds? Yes. I mean, what does... What does he want the mask to do? Well, as you know, the last three deals your father has been involved with haven't worked out. He has propositioned the mask into helping him recover his losses. The deal seems to be that in return for its help, the mask will be returned to its home. No. No, I don't believe this. Double that. Well, I'm quite pleased that you invited me over this evening, old sock. I've been wanting to discuss the Anderson deal with you. Um, where's the family? He lies. He is not pleased to be here. He'd rather be at home. The family? Oh, oh. Uh, well, Yvonne has a Wednesday evening backgammon group, and Eric and Adrian are playing tennis down at the club. Randy? Uh, just a thought. Now then, as I understand it, about the Anderson deal, we're talking about a straight split down the middle. No silent partners, no backstabbing, none of the usual business practices. The rip-off has already been set up. He's going to ask you for another five thou to take care of a matter. Well, I'm glad we've had a frank discussion. It makes it easier for me to tell you that to finalize the matter, we uh, urgently need, oh, 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 something in the neighborhood of uh, five thou to tie everything up neat and clean. So, when you're dealing with the kind of people we're dealing with, the uh, bribe comes first. He lies. He has a gambling debt to be paid. Offer him two thousand. He'll take it. How about two thousand? Mm, well, uh, yes, all right. Yes, we've got a deal. Ah, I think I like a glass of fresh juice to start today. Dad, we know about fresh juice. About your deal with the mask. A deal with what mask? Daddy, we all know. We've all heard you talking to the mask. Did you hear what it said to me? No. 
I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. What? What do you mean, you didn't hear anything? The mask... How would you know that I had a deal with a mask if you didn't hear? We could figure out what the deal was because of what you were saying. Ralph, you have to take it back. It's too soon. But, Dad, I heard you promised the mask you'd return it in exchange for help in reversing some business losses. We happen to know for a fact that the last two weeks have put us in another tax bracket. Give it a break, Daddy. Take it back. Are you people insane? Are you going to try to make me believe that a mask is responsible for my recent successes? Frankly, dear, I don't know. All I can see is that there is a connection between you and that mask, and I don't like it. Take it back to wherever it wants to go. Well, not take the mask anywhere, and that's the end of it. Well, I thought my family was pretty intelligent bunch of guys. You really surprised me. No! That's it! I told you the last time! No more! Shh! Know your voice. Why should I? You're the only one who can hear me. Yes, right. I forgot. Now look, this is the deal of the century for me. Don't you understand? There are only ten authentic Nubian statues in the world, and I have a chance to get my hands on six of them. I could practically corner the market. And don't you see what this means? I don't care. I want to get back home. You won't reconsider? No. That's my final word. As you say, the bottom line. Stubborn, huh? Now I can see why they kept you in that hut. I want to go home. Maybe if I stuck you away somewhere for a few days, you'd be more charitable. I don't care what you do. I just want to go home. Well, in that case, let's see what the basement will do for your bad temper. I don't care. I don't care. Put me down. Put me down. I want to go home. Put me down. I hit <laughs> Hmm. Now, that's what I call a real down-home southern fried chicken dinner. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I decided to make it for you to celebrate the disappearance of that mask. Decided to take our advice, huh, Daddy? Well, I thought about it, and it seemed to me that I was being, was being a bit stubborn. I mean, um, well, it's only a mask. What did you do with it, Dad? Oh, I got rid of it. You know, the, the usual... What's for dessert? Peach cobbler. Mmm, great. <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. You can say that again. It's been a long... Oh, Ralph, stop that. You know what I mean. I know, I know. Just fine. Listen, why don't we start making preparations for that vacation we put off before my last buying trip? Hmm? Ralph, I'd love to. But just a minute. This sounds like something I've heard before. Please don't flip my spirits up if you don't mean oh, it. Oh, honey, I do mean it. Let's face it. Well, neither one of us is getting any younger. Time is passing us by. Why not take a vacation? The islands. I want to go to the islands. Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados. Sun, clean, clear water, beautiful beaches. When do we leave? Hold on. It can't be tomorrow. I've got a really important deal to finalize before. How long will it take? Really anxious to take off, huh? Shouldn't take more than two weeks. I'll start making arrangements tomorrow. Oh, I don't know why, but it seems that this has been a very wearing month. You feel that way? Uh-huh. Well, it's almost over now. Time to go night-night. Dream about something good. Night, honey. Night, Ralph. I'm so happy. It seems like ages since we've had a vacation yeah. together. Ages. Dad, wake up! There's a fire! Open up! The house is on fire! 
Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Oshango Batala, The Mask. You were lucky, Mr. Palmer. Another five minutes and that fire would have swept through your place like I don't know what. What caused it? Well, as far as we can make out at this point, electrical shortage, a few sparks can sometimes fall on combustible material, things like that. Where did it start? In the basement, one of the usual places. Like I said, you're lucky the damage is minor. Now, if you don't mind the smell of burnt wood, you're perfectly free to go back inside the dangerous past. In the basement, did you say? The fire started in the basement? Right, that's right, sir. In the basement. Now, people were more careful not to store combustibles yes. within their... In the basement? Ralph? Are you all right? What's the matter, Daddy? Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. I was just thinking of the clean-up job we have to do. I thought you'd burn to a crisp down here. Nope. As you can see, I am still where you left me, and I still want to go home. Oh, now this is silly. You're being unnecessarily stubborn. Now, if you... No, I will not, and that's final. Now, you listen to me, you thick-headed chunk of wood. Ralph, what are you doing to... Oh, no! I thought you'd gotten rid of that thing. You see, that's why I want to leave. Nobody cares for me here. I thought I'd just store it down here in the basement. But you, you said you'd gotten rid of it. Well, as you can see, I haven't. And I can't yet. There's too much at stake. What are you talking about? What's at stake? All I can see is that you're going off your bird about a damn mask and endangering your family's life in the process. She's right. This isn't like you, Yvonne. I can't make myself believe that an intelligent, modern-thinking person like yourself would... Get rid of it! Do something with it, Ralph. Take it out of our lives before... Before it burns us all up. Well, I must say I'm quite surprised, old Bean. Quite. Considering the authenticity of the piece, I, uh... I really have to feel that I'm getting more than my money's worth. Um, may I be so bold as to inquire, why are you selling it? Well, I, I knew that you were drawn to the piece. Well, I'd like to say that uh, that is the case with a number of things that you have. Now, come, now, tell me the truth. Yvonne couldn't stand to have it around, hmm? You are absolutely right. Hmm. There seems to be something about this mass that burns her up when she's around it. Yes, I quite understand. Well, now, will you stay for a glass of Madeira? I'd love to, but uh, I'm late for an important meeting. Oh, well, yes, of course. Well, cheerio, pit pip and all that, right? <laughs> and I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Jolly good. I want to go home. Hmm? What? Oh, I must have dozed off. Too much Madeira, I suppose. I want to go home. What? <laughs> no, I must be dreaming. I told Ralph Palmer, and now I'm telling you, Max Falcon. I'm bored here, and I want to go home. I miss my friends and wives in the mask house. My word, it, it's speaking to me. Yes, to you. I can't believe it. What's so unbelievable? I'm bored, I'm lonesome, and I want out. Well, now, 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 just a moment, Mask. Now, I am not the sort you can order about. Oh, we'll see about that. Listen to this. Author and well-known art collector Max Falcon, 62 years old, was taken to Bellwood Hospital for treatments of a heart condition. Mr. Falcon also sustained second-degree burns of his hands and chest. Mr. Falcon declines to offer any explanation for the presence of the burns. He's in satisfactory condition. Sounds like Mr. Falcon not at all with a glass of something in one hand and a cigar in the other. Ralph, did you... did you sell? Yes, sir. I hate to admit it, but... Take it back, Ralph. For heaven's sakes, take it back. I'm on my way. <laughs> What? 
500 shedders to help me smuggle this thing back into... Please, please, Mr. Palmer, please lower your voice. Someone might hear us. Why should I pay you twice as much to help me return this as I paid to take it out? Uh, two reasons, sir. Inflation and the fact that I know where the mask house has been moved. What do you mean, moved? Uh, periodically, the mask house is moved, just to keep the mask from becoming bored or being in one spot. And I'm the one who knows which hut it is. Bruno, you're great. Here, you want to count it? Oh, no, no, I, I trust you. Come with me. To your left. Yes, right there. Look at that. It's magnificent. Mr. Palmer, that mask... Stop! Like... You don't have to tell me. Let's go. Wake up! Everybody! I'm back! We can see you're back. You should have seen me. A room of my own, admirers by the hundreds, a fireplace to stare if into. If you keep on boasting in this manner, we will make a rant, Mr. Have you sent back? We know how lonesome you have be, and how badly you wanted to return to your own kind. Just because you're a mouse doesn't mean you have to tell lies. You're absolutely right. I've been miserable, really miserable. I just come from a place where it seems that they change places every hour, sometimes every half hour, and you can never know what they really think. It's good to be back with honest faces again. Uh, let's talk about it tomorrow. Now's the time for sleep. <sighs> This is so beautiful. The water is so blue. The sky is so blue. It's just what we needed. What are you smiling about? I was just thinking about Max in the hospital. How vulnerable he looked. He didn't offer the slightest protest when I suggested that the mass be returned. Ralph, do you... Do you really think that the mass was actually responsible for those fires? For Max's burns? Oh, no, no, I don't. Oh. What's wrong? Back is sunburned. I wonder... Daddy! How... Check this out for me. There's this guy down the base selling these masks for five bucks each. What do you think? Take it back. Take it back! <laughs> Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Mask, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jim Mapp and David Downing. Featured in the cast were Mady Norman, Robin Braxton, Ben Wright, Don Blakely, and Ray Tosco. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.
This is Cicely Tyson. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of the Almighty to join these two in holy matrimony. Do you, Laura Lucille LaSalle, take... Just a minute. This is not the beginning of our story. Not that Laura LaSalle wouldn't like it to be. Laura fancies weddings all right, particularly one of her own. But the mere idea also scares the wits out of her. Now, this is more like it. We're much more apt to find our heroine at a cocktail party. The first to arrive and the last to leave. As you can imagine, there's nothing left of this party but the memory. The stale smell of tobacco, the overflowing ashtrays, the lipstick-stained cigarettes in the leftover guacamole dip, and discarded in a coaster on the bar, an expensive pair of false eyelashes. In the early morning hours, when the party wanes into some old Sinatra records and one more for the road, as someone else might slip off her shoes, it's Laura's habit to peel off her false eyelashes, to give them a rest from the fluttering, the flirty, the pretense. She squints across the bar at her face in the mirror. Without her lashes, her eyes look small, far away, lost. It's time, she reminds the girl in the mirror, to wipe that painted smile off your face. Put your happy eyes away, say goodnight, and go home to your own swinging singles. The party's over. And now... Our story has begun. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, For the Love of Laura, by Shirley Gordon. Our star... Janet Waldo. It's the morning after, high noon to be exact, when Laura finally rouses herself out of her drugged sleep. But of course, she needed that sleeping pill. And gradually brings the memory of last night into focus. She was sitting at the bar, watching the party die around her, until finally everyone else had gone home, and Richard had come to sit on the bar stool beside her. That's when she'd asked him to marry her. Did I really? Are you sure? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Laura, you okay? Why? Do I look like I'm not? You look tired, that's all. It's my eyelashes. I look like I don't have any eyes when I take off my lashes. Not true. You have beautiful eyes. Oh, Richard. You're always so gallant. So old world. Even at four o'clock in the morning when you'd like to close the bar and kick me out. Instead, you tell me I have beautiful eyes. You do. <clears throat> However, it would be nice if about now you took them home and put them to sleep. Are you always like this? Like what? So unruffled. I suppose so. Hey, what's to get ruffled about? You know what you are. What? You are the eye of my hurricane. I'd like to take refuge in your calm center forever. Oh, dear me. Uh, what I mean is, you're always so pleasant to be with, Richard. Are you always so pleasant to be with? You just said I was. I knew. I said that, but I mean, always. I I've never been with you, always. No, that's true. Never before the cocktail hour, really. Um, how are you in the mornings? 
Of course, it doesn't really matter because I generally sleep till noon myself. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm uncommonly good-humored in the morning. You see, that's what I mean. You're a prize, Richard. Really, you are. I'm surprised someone hasn't snapped you up by now. Marriage, you mean? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, marriage. Why don't we get married, Richard? You mean you and I? To each other? That is the way it works. Hmm. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Maddening. Of course, that's the way Richard would answer. Making a fictional supposition of my proposal as though we were talking about a book we'd read or a movie we'd seen. Suppose at this point in the story, the man and the woman got married. <sighs> well, after all, Richard is a writer. He always looks at things that way. At least he hadn't laughed in my face. I don't think. Anyway, Richard Robert Fairgate, you needn't feel so smug. You're not the only man I ever asked to marry me. There was Morty, for instance. I don't think any man ever had my interest at heart as much as Morty did. Of course, as my agent, his interest may have been in his pocketbook as much as his heart. But all the same, Morty really cared about me in his fashion. Gesundheit, you catching cold? Uh, I don't think so. One sneeze a cold doesn't make. This dressing room is too drafty. I'm going to speak to the management. Oh, Morty, darling, you're sweet to be concerned, but the dressing room is fine. We don't want to get a reputation for being temperamental, do we? Better they think you're temperamental than you catch your death and they cancel you. Oh. There goes our percentage of the gross. The thing about Morty was he was always there, holding my hand day and night. So it was only logical, it seemed to me, that we should get married. I mean... Married? You and me? What for? We're together all the time anyway. Lucky for me... I guess. But that logic works both ways. Because, of course, I immediately reconsidered. I mean, what would it be like actually being married to Morty, slumping around the house all day with his nose in the Hollywood reporter? Pass me the cream cheese, will you, darling? Morty? Hmm? The cream cheese? What's wrong with it? Tastes fine to me. I haven't had any yet. It's over on your side of the table. Would you pass it, please? Oh, sure. Here. On second thought, maybe you better skip the cream cheese. I notice you've been getting a little thick around the middle lately. Maybe I'm pregnant. You have that TV special coming up next month, and the camera adds ten pounds, you know. So does a baby. Baby what baby? Ours. If we're having one. What are you talking about? We're not going to have a baby. Well, why not? Because it doesn't say so in the Hollywood Reporter? Who's had a chance to read what it says in the Hollywood Reporter with all this conversation? I only asked you to pass me the cream cheese. Anyway, don't you ever read a regular newspaper? Don't you ever get curious about what's going on in the real world? Whatever's going on, sooner or later they'll make it into a movie. <laughs> In Marty's book, marriages were definitely made in Hollywood, not heaven. Anyway, I guess my bringing up the subject scared him off, because right after that, he gave up being my agent to go on the road with a punk rock band who called themselves the Five Chimps, because that's what they were. Laura, you did ask Richard to marry you last night. And in the cold gray light of the morning after, you're trying to remember what happened after that. Did he take you seriously? For that matter, how serious were you? Oh, Fuzz, my eyelashes. I must have left them over at Richard's, probably in the bar. I'll have to call him. They're my best pair. Cost me a bloody fortune. But... Suppose Richard brings up my asking him to marry me. Suppose it turns out he's interested. I mean, why shouldn't he be? Michael was. 
Michael. Of course I once asked Michael to marry me. What girl wouldn't? He was so handsome, with that absolutely heavenly body. Michael, darling, would you mind very much if I had you cast in bronze so I could take you home and put you on my mantelpiece? Uh, feel free, baby. Oh, on second thought, that would be a criminal waste of natural resources. I'd much rather keep you just as you are. Somehow, darling, I, I don't see you as a dust catcher. <laughs> right on. Michael wasn't exactly a scintillating conversationalist. And what would it be like living with that mindless, heavenly body of his 24 hours a day? Fortunately, I suppose, I stopped to think about that. Michael! 996! Michael! 997! 998! 999. Bingo. Mm. Do you feel strong enough to answer me now? What? I was calling you. Well, you were? I were. Uh, you, you, you want me for something? That was the general idea. Hey, you want me, you got me, baby. Yes, I know. So? What do you want me for? I can't imagine. Oh. Well, uh, if you think of anything, you let me know. One, two, three, four, five, six. Suddenly, seven, I couldn't think of a thing except eight, nine, ten. You're out. Michael somehow faded away with my summer tan, along with Steve. Steve in his sour golf socks. I can't believe I actually considered marrying him. But I did. It was just that he seemed so masterful with a nine iron in his hand. <laughs> Darling, when you hit a golf ball, it's sheer poetry. When I hit one, it's a bad joke. Don't worry, babe. Before you know it, you'll be queen of the greens. You just put yourself in my hands. I'd love to. Your hands are so big and strong. Yeah. Let me put my arms around you, and I'll show you how to swing. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> There's nothing more stimulating than taking lessons from a pro. So, of course, one thing led to another, and by the time we'd made it to the 18th hole... Darling, you've convinced me golf is my game. From now on, you'll never catch me without a club in my hand. Beautiful. That puts you right in my bag. How cozy. Oh, sounds like heaven to be carried around the rest of my life on a strong man's back. You're looking at one, babe. I have to admit it was tempting to give up being the mad young thing about town to become some regular guy like Steve's little missus. But what would he be like off the golf course? I remembered asking myself. The answer was obvious. He'd never be off the golf course. Hmm. Oh. Good morning, sweetheart. Up and at him. Uh, 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 up and at what? Move that cute little derriere of yours, darling. Mm. We're due at the first tea. Make mine coffee. Black. Come on, sugar babe. Rise and shine. Mm. Oh, there goes the snooze alarm. Time's a wasting. Steve, you set the alarm clock on our honeymoon? Well, we want to beat the crowd, don't we? I signed us up for a 6 a.m. starting time. Darling, I wouldn't think of starting anything at 6 a.m. Now, put morning. your kidding around, sugar babe. We're scheduled to tee off in about 12 minutes. I am not kidding around, sugar babe. And I'm already as teed off as you better hope I'll ever be. Thinking back on Steve and Michael and Morty certainly makes Richard all the more appealing. But then there was also Bernie. As I recall... Bernie was flawless. I wonder why I didn't marry him. Mm, what a perfect evening. I wish it could go on forever. That makes two of us. I suppose it could. Uh, go on forever, that is. If we both really wanted to. You mean... Why not? Hmm. I'll have to think about that. Uh, don't let me stop you, darling. 
<laughs> what is it? <laughs> what, what are you thinking? <laughs> did, did you ever hear the one about the Peruvian fella who fell in love with an Eskimo girl? And they went to a finish. Well, that... not exactly flawless. <laughs> then, Laura, the thought of all your past near misses makes Richard seem all the more appealing. Hmm. Despite all his messy pipe leavings, one can at least carry on a civilized conversation with Richard. Too civilized, perhaps. While Michael was all brawn and no brain, Richard is... Hmm. I wonder if he ever takes off his glasses. Darling. Hmm. It's late. Aren't you coming to bed? Well, uh, I'm not tired. Good. That makes two of us. Come along, darling. I've put new satin sheets on the bed. Satin sheets? Mm hmm. A red and white check tablecloth would be more appropriate. Oh, darling, you're so amusing. Come to bed. Now, I've only just gotten to the middle of my first chapter. You're not planning to write the whole book before you come to bed, are you? Well, once I get an idea in my head, I like to follow through on it. So do I. Look, dear, why don't you go to sleep? And when I finish this up, I'll just bunk here on the couch so I won't disturb you. I can't tell you how that would disturb me. Well, then why don't you get up and give me a cup of nice hot coffee? <sighs> why not? I'm not doing anyone any good lying here. Yes. Richard and his cerebral personality might wear a little thin. Let's hope he didn't take me seriously last night. Maybe I'd better try and avoid him for a while, just in case. But, oh, fuzz, my eyelashes. I couldn't bear it if he emptied them out with the dirty ashtrays. I'll have to risk it. Here. Richard, darling, it's Laura. Laura, well, you're up early, aren't you? Early for you, that is. I, uh, I hope I'm not interrupting your work, Richard. It's all right. I was only doing some thinking. Yes, of course. Well, uh, this will only take a minute. I, I'm just calling about Matter my... Matter of fact, I was thinking about us. Us? You proposed to me last night. That is, early this morning. Remember? Uh, that's another thing about you, Richard. You're always sober, no matter how many drinks you've had. It's a gift. In any event, Laura, dear, I've decided it's inconceivable. What is? You and me in holy wedlock. You decided? Well, you put the question to me. I figured I owed you an answer. What do you mean, it's inconceivable? Being married to you. I'm afraid I couldn't hack it. You couldn't hack being married to me? Oh, not that you aren't amusing to be with, Laura, dear, but all the time, night and day. My dear Laura, you're not that amusing. Well, really, Richard, you're not exactly a floor show yourself, you know. Oh, Laura, my dear, I don't want you to feel hurt. Hurt? Oh, don't be silly. Anyway, you couldn't have actually thought that I was actually serious about this whole thing. You weren't? Of course not. Well, then. No harm done, right? Right. See you soon for cocktails? Beautiful. No harm done. Just a little wounded pride, that's all. After all, Richard is the only one to flatly refuse my proposal of marriage. I never really gave the others a chance. I wonder what would happen if I did. Laura, what a nice surprise. Oh, Lordy, darling, it's been ages. A couple of months at least. What brings you here? I didn't know you went in for punk rock. I don't, but I'm fascinated by chimpanzees, uh, particularly ones who can play the electric guitar. Yeah, check out the one on the bull fiddle. He ain't bad either. Uh, not my type, too much hair. Uh, matter of fact, could we find some place a little quieter so we can talk? Oh, sure, sure, sure. We can use the boys' dressing room. They won't mind. In here. Talk about what? Hmm. This is a nicer dressing room than you ever managed to get for me. Well, when you've got five chimps behind you, it's called clout. Uh, so what do you want to talk about? Us. 
Morty, darling, I've missed you. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, you ain't the only one. You mean you've missed me, too? Baby, right this minute, you look like a million dollars to me. Oh, considering I'm wearing my best mink, I should think I'd have the edge over a gym. <laughs> you better believe it. So what do you have in mind? You and me resuming our old business arrangement? I sell, you deliver? Uh, Morty, um, remember, just before you went on the road with your uh, King Kong Gong show, I suggested we might get together under a uh, more permanent arrangement? You mean that we should get hitched, legitimate like? Sure, I remember. Well, I didn't mean to scare you out of town with the idea, darling. You you could have given me a simple no. I'd have understood. After all, looking after my professional interests was a full-time job in itself, as you said. Yeah. Well, it's what I said then, but I've changed my mind. You had the right idea, baby. Let's make it legitimate. This time, it was my turn to be scared out of town. To the beach, to clear the nightclub smoke out of my lungs and bask in the sunbeams bouncing off Michael's gleaming suntan pectorals. Hey! Laurie girl! Long time no see. Michael Dunn. <laughs> oh, you're even bigger and browner than I remembered. Uh, the sea air works wonders. <laughs> so, so they say. Oh, so they do. Yeah. It must get kind of lonely for you, though, living way out here all by yourself. With only Jonathan Livingston Seagull to keep you company. Yeah, right on, baby. You uh, got any ideas? Nothing that would interest a free spirit like you, darling. You try me. But matrimony is such an old-fashioned word. You got me wrong, sweetie. That's what I thought. I'm just your everyday old-fashioned guy. The kind any girl would love to take home to meet her mother. Oh, my mother would love to meet you, darling. Oh, well, then it's settled. All we have to do now is name the day. Right on. I'll call you, darling. I'll have to go home and check my calendar. Well, Richard, it appears you are in the minority. Other men don't seem to be put off by the prospect of spending the rest of their lives in my amusing company. Morty, Michael, and just to further prove my point... Steve! Oh, Steve, darling! Still in beautiful form, I see. Likewise, sugar babe. Hey, where you been keeping yourself? I thought I'd lost you in the rough somewhere. I'm not as easy to lose as a golf ball, darling. <laughs> I'll drink to that if you'll join me. Uh, perfect. Matter of fact, I've, I've just been getting in the mood to become a joiner. Great. Let's go. You know, as soon as we have a drink, I'll get you a membership blank and show you where the locker rooms are. See, darling, I had something else in mind besides joining your precious golf club. You mean you and me tying the old knot? But that's all the better. Is my wife, the club will give you a discount. You see, Richard, every other man I know is eager to marry me. Of course, there's Bernie, too. I must admit, Laura, I was beginning to wonder if I was ever going to see you again. Every time I've tried to call you lately, I've gotten your answering service. Oh, sorry, Bernie, darling. I've been swamped. But now, at last, I'm all yours. You mean that... If I do? Oh, you'd make me a very happy man. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be hysterically happy. Oh, I, I just thought of the one about the Paraguayan who propositioned a, a Latvian. You see, they were both at so... <laughs> You see, Richard, what did I tell you? Bernie, too. That leaves you the only holdout, darling. And it puts me and my wounded pride right back where I started. Are you the one I think I want just because you're playing hardest to get? Hello? Laura, Richard here. Oh, Richard, darling, I was, I was just thinking of you. Uh, not too unkindly, I hope. Because I've been having some second thoughts myself. Second thoughts? About us. Who knows, Laura, dear? We might make a go of it at that. You mean you've changed your mind? You're saying yes? Yes. Laura? What do you 
think? I think I better have a few second thoughts myself. Cicely Tyson again. And here's the fourth act of For the Love of Laura. Leave it to Richard to spoil the fun. Now that I can have any one of them I want, who needs them? You do, Laura. Look at yourself in the mirror again without your false eyelashes. No wonder you keep hanging on after the party's over. Who wants to go home alone? So, what if Richard's a little bookish? Or if Michael has fried his brain staying out in the sun too long? What does it really matter if Morty's hung up on show business or if Steve thinks life begins and ends on a golf course? Or if Bernie sees it as one big racist joke? Maybe it is. Nobody's perfect, right? You're not actually expecting Robert Redford to ride up in a white Mercedes, are you? It would be a nice, cozy feeling having a man's bathrobe hanging on the back of your bathroom door permanently, wouldn't it? The only question is, whose initials do I want to have embroidered on the pocket? Richard? So he's a little preoccupied with words, particularly his own. Being a writer also means he's sensitive, romantic, understands women... Richard could be the ideal husband. Laura, darling, you all right? Lovely. It was a beautiful party. And I'm glad everyone has finally gone home. So am I. <sighs> I can take off my eyelashes and relax. You don't need those. You're beautiful just as you are. A woman is beautiful when she's loved. Hmm. Claude reigns to Betty Davis and Mr. Skeffington. It's true, all the same. You're beautiful. And you're loved. Oh, Richard. Darling. And I remember when you used to call everybody darling. Now it's no longer an empty word, thanks to you. Giving meaning to words is my business. I used to think it would be dreadful being married to a writer. I thought you'd always have your mind on your work and never have any time for me. A writer can't simply sit down and write. He has to get ideas. And, sweetheart, you give me ideas. And your work will never come between us? My work will never be more important to me than you are. And I need never feel jealous of the women you make love to on your typewriter? Never, Laura, dear. Never. There's no woman of literature or legend who can compare to you. You are my... Desdemona, my Galatea, my Cleopatra, my my Scarlet O'Hara, my Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Oh, Richard, marrying you has made me the happiest girl in the world. Would it, Richard? Are you the one? I wonder. After all, Morty knows me better, and looking after me is practically second nature with him. He's loyal, thoughtful. Protective? Yes, Morty could be the ideal husband. You sure you're warm enough, baby? Mmm, toasty. You want me to get up and get you another blanket? No. Oh, no, darling. I'm fine. Yeah. The fire's getting low. Maybe I'd better put on a little lard. Oh, darling. We don't need a fire to keep us warm. Mm. You said it, doll. Funny. You know, I always used to think your only interest in me was professional. I always tried to keep my mind on my job where you were concerned, baby. But let me tell you, it wasn't always easy. Oh, I thought the only thing you ever had on your mind was show business. <laughs> eh, there's no business like it. But it's not what makes the old world go around, you know what I mean? This is it, baby. What you and I have found together. And you'd still love me as much as ever, even if I gave up my career? Whatever you want, baby, is absolutely oak with me. And you'll never leave me 
To hitch your wagon to another star? No, sweetheart. You're the only star I want shining in my blue heaven. You're my Garbo, my Dietrich, my Marilyn Monroe, my Shirley Temple. Oh, Morty, marrying you has made me the happiest girl in the world. Maybe it is you, Marty. Maybe you are the one. Oh, but how can I be sure? As long as I still get goosebumps every time I think about Michael. If he looks that beautiful in a pair of swim trunks, imagine what he would look like in a tuxedo at our wedding. Oh, he's so healthy and tan and as devoted as a lap dog. It's true. Michael could be the ideal husband. Oh. Oh. oh, what a glorious day. Hey, Lori, girl. You know, you're getting in great shape. Uh-huh. And you'll out swim and out jog me. Oh, I feel marvelous. All the sun and surf and sea air makes my soul sing. Oh, right on, baby. Oh. And to think I used to look for the answers in, in, in crowded, smoke-filled rooms. Oh, little Laura. Oh. My poor little lost lamb. Oh, Michael. My big... Strong lifesaver. Oh, you did save my life, darling. I was drowning in my sea of regret, and you swam out and rescued me. Well, you were just off on the wrong foot, baby. Oh. A fancy mink coat and cocktail bars ain't where it's at. Oh, right on. Oh, Michael, will it always be like this for us? Clean and simple and beautiful? Oh, always. Just you and me. And the sun and the sand and the sea. And the seagulls oh. and pelicans and sandpipers. The starfish and sea urchins and Portuguese men of war. Oh. And the crabs and the shrimp and the barnacles. Oh, Michael, marrying you has made me the happiest girl in the world. It could be idyllic, couldn't it, Michael? Maybe you're the one after all. But then Steve is the outdoor type too, and, 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 and he's so pro, so masterful, so macho. Steve was probably made to be the ideal husband. Beautiful, babe. I couldn't have hit it any cleaner myself. Well, you showed me how, darling. And I'm going to show you how simple it can be to find happiness. Simple as sinking this little white ball in that little old hole over there. I didn't used to be able to do either sink the ball or find happiness until I took lessons from my pro, (laughs) Steve, darling. Stick around, sugar babe. I'll teach you everything you'll ever want to know. You're my birdie, my eagle, my double eagle, my national open championship. Oh, Steve, marrying you has made me the happiest girl in the world. Maybe you could do more than improve my golf game, Steve, darling. Maybe you're the one. Unless... Hmm, Bernie? Why not? He's tall, dark, and handsome. The perfect escort. So why not the ideal husband? Tired? Hmm, a little. But it's been a perfect honeymoon trip so far. Well, you just cuddle up and rest your head on my shoulder. We'll be there soon. Hmm... No hurry. I'm perfectly comfortable now. Just a few more miles. Then wait till you see a perfect spot to wind up our honeymoon. Mm, sounds perfect. Sweetheart, you asleep? Mm-hmm. I, I just thought of another good one. <laughs> oh, re- re- really, darling? <laughs> Tell me. Well, that was Miss Arab who married a Puerto Rican chick, you see. Uh-huh. <laughs> and for their honeymoon, yeah. they took this trip to China. Uh, yes, yes, darling, go on, go on. <laughs> oh, oh, no wonder I married you, sweetheart. <laughs> you're always the perfect audience. Oh, darling, you're always so amusing. <laughs> well, wait till you hear this one. Uh-huh. It's even better than the one about the two Romanians, uh-huh. remember? Oh, how can I forget? <laughs> oh, oh. Or the one about the Italian Count Uh and the Irish Colleen. (laughs) (laughs) Or the Tennessee Hillbilly who tried to bulldog a Texas deer. (laughs) Oh, Bernie. Marrying you has made me the happiest girl in the world. (laughs) 
Life with Bernie could be laughs. Yes, darling, you might even be the one. One of you has to be. If you don't take the step now, Laura, my girl, you never will. So, where does your happiness lie? With Richard? Marty? Michael? Steve? Or Bernie? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and one to grow on. But which one? Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of the Almighty to join these two in holy matrimony. Do you, Laura Lucille LaSalle, take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to love and to cherish till death do you part? I do. And do you... Hold it, Reverend Darling. Before you say the name of the lucky man, perhaps I'd better explain. You see, what I had to do was carefully separate fantasy from reality. You have beautiful eyes. Fantasy. My dear Laura, you're not that amusing. Reality. I'm just your everyday old-fashioned guy. Fantasy. You want me, you got me, baby. Reality. We'll follow the sun together, you and me. Fantasy. Good morning, sweetheart. Up and at him. Reality. You just cuddle up and rest your head on my shoulder. Fantasy. <laughs> Did you ever hear the one about this? Reality. Whatever you want, baby, is absolutely oak with me. Fantasy. There goes our percentage of the gross. Reality. Marty. Imperfection personified. Couldn't hit a golf ball with a tennis racket. Wouldn't be caught dead on a surfboard. Looks like a penguin in a tuxedo. Neither brains nor brawn to brag of, but, Morton, you are as comfortable as an old pair of shoes. The kind you like to slip into after the party's over. Carry on, Reverend Darling. And do you, Morton Leroy Webner, take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to love and to cherish? Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, For the Love of Laura, was written by Shirley Gordon and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your hostess was Cicely Tyson. Our star was Janet Waldo. Featured in the cast were Mike Miner, Shepard Mankin, Lou Horn, Barney Phillips, and Vic Perrin. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Leonard Nimoy. Listen to us tomorrow. I've got another story of adventure about men and women defying the odds. Listen here tomorrow. And that's this week's Mutual Presents feature. The Mutual Audio Network brings the best of old-time radio and modern audio theater to the world. Be sure to subscribe through the Mutual Audio Network podcast feed, any of our podcast days, or the Mutual YouTube channel, which includes MadCon and many other extra features and shows. See you all next time at Mutual Presents. Good night. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. We invite you to continue the amazing audio tomorrow on Mutual with the Monday Matinee. Our weekly series of dramatic, theatrical, classic, eclectic, and live radio dramas. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed every day for the world's largest curated collection of audio drama. Or find the Monday Matinee feed in your favorite podcast players. See you tomorrow at the Matinee, and thanks so much for listening. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.